yeah. So we'll just um, we'll just edit it if we have to. Yeah. And we've got fifteen participants so far. It's uh, I was thinking it's a good thing we didn't start the the waiting room because then we would be very I would be very busy admitting yes. people. So yes. this yes. this is probably a good idea. Yes. Oh, there's Scott. Hey, hi, Scott. Sorry you're muted, but everybody's muted uh, until Jenny's talk is over. Oh, Isabel. Isabel, welcome. William, welcome. Oh, do you know William? I've had the pleasure of having William in a couple of my classes, so. Yeah, I've, 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 I've seen him. We've, we've seen each other. Mm -hmm. I can just turn off the sound on mine. Sure. Let's see here. OK, what happened here? I don't know. It right. looks like students should be, everybody, all the attendees right. should be automatically muted. So it's 12 o'clock now, but I think maybe we should give it like a, maybe a couple more minutes right. or so. Just want to make sure it doesn't look like everybody's muted. So hmm, maybe there's a setting that we missed. I don't know. When I go to the security setting, it looks like it, it looks like it should, they should be muted. Yeah. We'll do our best. Thank you for your patience, yes. everyone who's here. We are um, figuring things out still. A, a year of doing things online, but of course, it's a, it's a, it's a continual learning process. So we've got uh, 30 participants now. I think we could, I think we can get started. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, if more people kind of straggle in during the introduction, that's good too. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Okay, and we are recording. Yes, we are. Um, so, uh, welcome to today's event. This is a joint presentation of the Women's History Month and the Social Sciences Occasional Lectures. My name is Nina Rosenstand, and uh, I'm a professor of philosophy at Mesa College, and I'm also the chair of our occasional lecture series. And I am very happy to be able to welcome you to our resurrected series, which was abruptly silenced by the COVID pandemic exactly a year ago. In March 2020, today's speaker, Dr. Jennifer Syme, was supposed to have given her presentation in front of an audience. But of course, we had to cancel because of the COVID lockdown. But now we're back in a virtual format. Before I introduce our speaker, I have to mention a few formalities. True to our tradition going back over 20 years, faculty members can obtain flex credit by attending this workshop. And the flex number is 64116411. If you have already signed up for FLEX, you can verify your attendance at any time afterwards. If you have not signed up yet, then you'll have to sign up for the workshop before midnight tonight. And registering for this event does not mean that you are also registered for FLEX, by the way. If you're a student and your professor is giving you extra credit for attending, please put your name, your class, and your professor's name in the chat. Because of recent Zoom bombings, we will be closing off live comments until the presentation is over. And then you're welcome to ask questions. You are welcome to post questions in the chat and they will be addressed after the presentation to the best of our ability. And it's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Jennifer Syme is a professor of anthropology at Mesa College. She received her PhD in social cultural anthropology from Columbia University in 2009. Her primary field of interests are anthropology of religion, anthropology of the body, anthropology of media, 
politics of memory and social movements. Her regional focus is Galicia, which is Spain. Her publications include Exhumation, the Search for the Dead and the Resurrection of the Uncanny in Contemporary Spain, published in the journal Anthropology and Humanism. And there's a work in progress entitled Materializing Nostalgia, Feet, YouTube, and the Pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela for the journal Material Religion. The title of her presentation today is Light, Color, Madness, Memorializing Women's Resistance in Franco Spain. Welcome, Dr. Sine. Thank you. So, um... Before I begin kind of the, the formal talk, um, I want to say um, thanks to a number of people. Um, first to Nina Rosenstand for inviting me today and waiting a full year um, before I could actually give my talk. Uh, my colleagues in the Women's Studies Advisory Committee for their very hard work in organizing Women's History Month. And I would also like to thank the Dr. Constance M. Carroll Humanities Institute for its gender, generous funding of Women's History Month. So um, I'm going to set up my slides here, so bear with me. Um, okay, um, just before I, I get started, I just wanna say um, a word that um, I will at certain points in this talk, um, be mentioning um, issues that some people might find to be um, particularly disturbing. Um, I will make mention of, of torture, um, violence, including sexual violence, and I will um, be showing in one slide images of skeletonized human remains. Um, and this is all done in the academic context of a discussion of the Franco dictatorship um, in, in Spain and resistance to that dictatorship. So in this talk, um, I will be discussing an anthropological project that I have recently started working on. It's about how people in a particular part of Spain, Galicia, how they memorialize two women for their acts of resistance against the fascist dictatorship in Spain that lasted from 1939 until 1975. And as strange as it might sound, light and color and madness are seen as the tools of their resistance. So there's certain questions that have emerged in this course, uh, the course of this project that are kind of ones that organize my talk today. What's involved in acts of memorialization? How did light, color, and madness work as a form of resistance to fascism in Spain? And how are light, color, and madness imagined to be a form of resistance in the present moment as well? Um, this, talk, this talk is very much representing the beginning stages of my attempt to grapple with these questions. So there's no hard conclusions that I'm drawing here. Instead, I'm going to be just ex taking this chance to like explore themes that are, um, that are relevant to my research. So the first thing that we need to, to do here is, um, is situate ourselves geographically. So I have up here a, um, a map of Spain on the left and clearly demarcated, you can see the different regions um, of Spain. And up here in the northwest corner, north of Portugal, um, you can see the region of Galicia, which is um, like some other regions of Spain, very, it has, um, it's very distinctive, both culturally and, um, and linguistically. And then on the right over here, um, the red star is representing the city of Santiago de Compostela. This is the capital of Galicia. And I've been doing field work um, there, uh, ethnographic field work there since 2003. So a word on, on sources and me methodology. Um, when I teach, as my students here know, when I teach um, uh, introduction to cultural anthropology, I typically talk about participant observation. This is the process by which an anthropologist immerses herself deeply in a culture under study. 
And this we consider in anthropology to be the cornerstone of anthropological fieldwork, at least in cultural anthropology. And of course, this is all true, um, but we use also in cultural anthropology, a number of other methodologies and diverse sources. So I did carry out participant observation, um, classic field work in Santiago in July in 2017. And this was kind of my entry point into this project. And since then I've been doing research um, more at a distance um, in part because of the pandemic, I was supposed to go back last year. Um, so it's been a lot of reviewing of Galician language and some Spanish language websites newspaper articles, published interviews, reviewing um, archived videos of memorialization projects and movements um, that are up on YouTube, um, Galician language documentaries. Most of the stuff I, I work with is um, in Galician language. And um, then the, the one book that's written on this subject, Las Marias de Santiago um, is written by a Spanish journalist. So the women that I am going to be talking about today. Um, their names are Marusha and Coralia Padino Ricard. They were two sisters, well known in Santiago for ostensibly for having been eccentrics who walked the streets of the city beginning in the late 30s and early 40s, wearing bright clothing and heavy makeup. They both passed away in the 1980s. And when I first started doing field work in Spain in 2003, I didn't know much more. And honestly, I didn't really look to find out because I was focusing on my field work, which was on the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. And, they, and, and these women weren't really on, their, on, on my radar. I only encountered them in a the form of a dilapidated statue of them in a city park that you can see on the left and a kind of kitsch representation that appeared on things like t-shirts that had their nicknames um, as marias the marias and as duas in punto two o'clock um, precisely that's the time of day that they used to begin their daily strolls through the streets of santiago and it was only um, actually in 2017, when I was in Santiago de Compostela for a month doing field work, that I began to hear different stories being told about Marusha and Coralia, that they came from a leftist family um, and their family was deeply involved in anarchist politics. They had been brutalized during the Spanish Civil War, um, which lasted from 1936 to 1939. And that some people, particularly leftist activists and feminists in Santiago, um, now interpret their supposed eccentricities as actually a form of resistance against fascism and against the military dictatorship that was formed at the end of the Civil War in Spain. So there are um, some historical questions to be addressed here. Who were these women? Who were Marusha and Coralia? Um, what happened to them? And then there are, um, I think, more anthropological questions that that I started thinking about over the um, uh, over the past couple of years. Um, what stories do people tell about them now in the present? And what do people? What do these stories reveal? Um, about people's relationship to the past, um, specifically the past of Spain's military dictatorship and you know, their relationship um, to the present, their ideas about the future. And then from here too, certain themes began to emerge from these questions. Um, themes pertaining to the work of memory in Spain, which I will um, talk quite a bit about today. The links that people conceptualize between madness and resistance, which aren't really obvious ones and between color and light on resistance. And um, so these are the themes that I'm gonna be delving into today, but first um, it's necessary to give a brief historical overview of Spain's dictatorship itself. Let me just pause here. So in Spain on July 18th, 1936, sectors of Spain's military attempted to overthrow the democratically elected government of Spain's Second Republic, 
and I have the dates of the young Se uh, Second Republic up there. In so doing, they provoked the outbreak of civil war between Republicans and their supporters and um, the nationalists and their own allies. Um, in general, the Republicans were those to, who supported the democratically elect, elected government. And I just wanna make this point since we use the term in English and obviously in the United States in a very different way. Um, the Republicans were supported by labor unions, communists of uh, many different affiliations, anarchists, the working class, rural peasants, the educated middle class, um, and they had some material support from the Soviet Union and Mexico. The nationalists, um, and in Spanish, this is actually nacionales, um, consisted of the um, insurrectionist element of the military supported by the wealthy classes, the Catholic church, um, Spanish fascist militants. And as the war wore on, they received material support from Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. And just um, a quick example of this, um, for example, Nazi warplanes um, uh, bombed a um, uh, Spanish uh, city. So the war lasted three years. It ended in 1939. It ended when Madrid fell to the nationalists. On April 1st, um, 1931, a military dictatorship was installed with General Francisco Franco as the head of state. And as you can see here in this slide, um, it shows this shows a rally in support of the new government in the Plaza Mayor in Madrid. And you can see the crowds of people making the fascist salute here um, as portraits of Franco are paraded through um, the plaza. It's really an important part of Spain's history that in the immediate, that the immediate post-war period was a time when the new dictatorship would um, took punitive measures against um, what they refer to as the so-called enemies of Spain, those who were on the wrong side of the civil war. Um, and these punitive measures took a number of different forms um, from social, uh, sh social shunning to the rationing of food and most brutally and notoriously extrajudicial killings. Many people who supported the Second Republic were rounded up, sometimes tortured and then killed, usually by gunshot, and their bodies were dumped in mass graves other supporters of the Republic went into exile. The dictatorship would last 36 years until Franco's death of natural causes in November 1975. With his death under immense international pressure, Spain's transition to democracy began. Rather than confronting the past through, for example, a truth and reconciliation process, Spain chose amnesty in an attempt to turn away from the past of dictatorship and toward the future. The amnesty law of 1977 granted amnesty to those who committed atrocities during the war and during the, the dictatorship. So you can think of the perpetrators of um, the killings of those people who ended up of, in mass graves. Those people were, were uh, essentially off the hook. This amnesty law became referred to as the Pact of Silence and the Pact of Oblivion. The politicians who orchestrated Spain's transition to democracy chose amnesty in a turn toward peace and stability rather than accountability and justice. A fear of reopening old wounds. This is a constant, um, a constant phrase in the in the in the in the discourse uh, in the seventies, but even till today of this fear of reopening old wounds, better let those just stay where they are. A fear of reopening old wounds, old lines of fissure in Spanish society was what drove this decision. Um, but ultimately the attempt to forget the brutal, brutal past of war and dictatorship was not um, successful. And here I do wanna speak um, briefly of those, those, mass, um, those mass graves. The past may have been taboo in some ways, but it wasn't forgotten. As time passed, a generation of Spaniards came of age who barely remembered the dictatorship and they were not afraid to attending to those, those old wounds that I mentioned before. 
people remembered the sites of those old mass graves where bodies were dumped in the war in the early years of the dictatorship. In the year 2000, a journalist named Emilio Silva managed to find the grave of his grandfather, who was a Republican, and to um, exhume that grave. Um, he, found, he was involved in the founding of the first association for the recovery of historical memory in the year 2000. And the focus of this association was to bring ordinary people together with forensic anthropologists and other experts um, to exhume the dead and finally give them a dignified burial. This was, the, this was the point of emphasis here, a dignified burial. Following the amnesty law, the focus was definitely not on accountability and justice. The perpetrators of the crimes were not sought out. And I just wanted to show you here, um, certainly for a lot of people, um, mass graves are not the first thing that come to mind when you think of Spain, but I want to give you a, a sense of just how, um, of just how many there are, how, wide, how widespread um, they are. They are everywhere in, um, in the Spanish landscape. Um, they've been found on the sides of freeways next to cemeteries, uh, alongside fields that have been farmed for crops. Um, and what this um, map shows in particular isn't just a map of the, of the mass graves, but it's color coded to show um, the graves in, in green where there's, they haven't been touched. Um, the um, graves in red that have been fully excavated um, or, or partially excavated. And then yellow ones are where bodies um, had actually been, been moved um, for whatever reason, not given a dignified burial, but um, they, were, they were moved. <clears throat> so um, the current government has, of Spain estimates that approximately 2,600 mass graves exist. Some contain just a few bo bodies and others, many others contain dozens. And altogether is estimated that between 100,000 and 200,000 um, dead lie in these graves. And I think it's important to note too, because um, sometimes people think of, well, well, we'll zoom the bodies, we'll identify them, and then, we, um, that's, and then we'll have closure um, and we'll, we'll move on from this. And I think it's important to note that um, this, is, this kind of work, um, the work of exhuming bodies, the work of memory itself, that I'll talk more about in a moment, it's not something that, um, that ever really ends um, in just a practical logistical sense. For the mass graves, not all these bodies can be exhumed. Um, of those that are exhumed, not all can be identified. Um, and the last thing I want to say about these graves is that they have been they have become emblematic of the work of memory in Spain, um, the most visible sign of this work of memory. Um, and of course, when I turn back to um, Marusha and Cordalia. I'm going to be talk about, talking about the way that the work of memory is done in a different way. And here, um, I want to actually, just a little bit of a theoretical aside, um, I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by, by the, the work of memory, what I mean by this phrase, um, because I want to think about memory here as something that doesn't just like kind of exist in people's heads, but it actually, there's like cultural work, cultural labor around it. And it's something that's, um, that's created. In other words, we could almost think of memory, um, it's, it, memory is something that people do together in a, in a social process. So um, when I write like in this slide that, that Spain is fraught with the work of memory, I'm referring to the fact that ever since um, Francisco uh, Franco, the dictator of Spain died in 1975 and Spain's transition to democracy began, um, people, not everyone, but a lot of people, ordinary people, some politicians have been engaged in analyzing and trying to understand the relationship between democratic Spain and the fascist past of its military dictatorship. And in the process, they broke the taboos of silence and began to talk about what happened during the civil war and the dictatorship. And they began this social process of remembering. Uh, lots of times we hear archeological 
um, metaphors for the work of memory. And I'm going to employ some of those here. So if we use like these ar archeological um, metaphors of excavation for the work of, of memory, I would say that the process of uncovering memory is a less like the discovery of some perfectly formed object that's been untouched by the passage of time than it is as Freud once described it a long time ago, more like uncovering bit by bit the ruins of a city. Memory work involves the assembling of the traces of um, and fragments of the past. It's imaginative. People have to figure out how they put these fragments and pieces together. But that doesn't mean that it's, um, that it's totally made up or, or fictional. But we do have to be aware of how the concerns of the present can figure in color how we interpret the past. Um, another note on memory, um, as the anthropologist Michael Lambeck has claimed, memory work often makes a claim that carries moral authority. Um, it establishes a particular relationship, a moral relationship with the past. And this is certainly the case in Spain. Um, I do think that when people are engaged in this, in processes of remembering the dictatorship, telling stories about it, um, they are, they understand themselves to be engaged in a moral and ethical task. And as I'm going to be emphasizing in the rest of this talk, storytelling is an essential aspect of the work of memory. And I would argue to the work of justice in a place like Spain where the process of grappling with the legacies of the dictatorship was long delayed. Through storytelling, through the creation of narrative, testimony, rumor, the revelation of secrets, this is how people engage in the work of memory. So, um, during the rest of this, I'm going to be talking about um, about some about stories, um, storytelling as memory work. And to begin, um, coming back to Marusha um, and Coralia, when it comes to them, um, a few things um, were known for sure. They were both born in Santiago. Marusha. Um, who is, uh, was born in um, 1898. She's the woman in the striped dress in the picture. And Coralia, the taller one, was born in 1913. So a big age difference between these two sisters. Um, and there were 13 children of all, in all, in their family. And 11 of them um, survived past the age of five. They came from a working class family. Their father was a shoemaker and their mother was a seamstress. And um, these two were taught how to um, sew. They were trained as seamstresses as well. And during the Second Republic, um, they were fixtures in the city. Um, they took their daily strolls with a third sister named Sara, and they were noted for wearing these brightly colored clothes that they, um, that they made at home. The men of the family were members of the CNT. Um, this is the uh, National Confederation of Labor, and it's a major anarchist organization associated with the labor movement in Spain that um, still exists to this day. After the Civil War broke out in 1936, Marusha and Coralia's father and brothers, um, they fled. They knew they would be targeted by those who supported the military coup because of their involvement in leftist anarchist politics. Several of the brothers managed to stay in hiding for years. Um, their fa the father was, was found um, and he was tortured and sentenced to prison. So the women of the family, including um, Marusha and Coralia, they, um, they remained behind. They stayed at home and they bore the brunt of humiliation and punishment carried out by phalangists, that is Spanish fascist officials, who attempted to pressure them into revealing the location of the hideouts of their family members. Neighbors bore witness to the random searches of the house carried out at any hour, day and night. 
their heads were shaved in the street. They were forced to drink castor oil and lose control of their bowels. They were addressed as rojos, which translates to reds as in communists, but it's a pejorative for anyone who didn't support the incipient fascist state. And they were referred to as putas, which uh, translates to whores or bitches. Some people thought that they were brought to the small mountain outside Santiago, Monte Pedroso, and that there they were tortured and raped. So in this new world of military dictatorship and state terror, what became of Marusha and Coralia? We're left with stories, stories of fear, humiliation, and violence that I recounted earlier, those stories of head shaving and castor oil and searches and possible torture and rape. The sisters themselves leave us no testimony, no text or memoir that would help explain or bridge the gap between the time of the war and the sisters' lives during the dictatorship. And in this gap, other people supply sub explanatory nar narratives and tell stories. What we do know is that the sisters, um, for most part, remain hidden in their homes, but Eventually they emerged to take again, once again, they emerged to take their daily stroll while wearing colorful clothes and thick layers of makeup. And apparently they cat called students. Um, Santiago is a university town. And in the late 1930s and early 40s, all of this, um, the color, the makeup, the cat calling, it wasn't only scandalous, but it was dangerous. To act like this, people thought they must have gone mad. To understand why, we need to see their actions in the context of, of this quote unquote new gender ideology in Spain, which is actually um, a very reactionary gender ideology. Um, and I, I found this, this cover of this magazine that um, goes pretty far in summing up certain things. Um, this magazine for women, this issue is dated um, May of 1939, just one month after the war ended. We see a blonde woman, a blonde mother attending to her blonde child. And we should note here that Nazi-esque Aryan ideals were alive and well in Spain at this time. And we see in the background, another mother sending her children off to school in this kind of picture perfect village in the background. And her arm is raised in the fascist salute and her children, um, the children return her fascist salute. Catholicism was the only recognized religion in Spain during the dictatorship. It was the only one permitted. And accordingly, the Virgin Mary was idealized, not only as the mother of God, but as a model for women. Women were supposed to be maternal, asexual, and attend to the care of their children and their home. Women in the dictatorship lost the rights that they had gained in Spain's Second Republic. They were now legally considered to be dependents of their male relatives. They needed a male relative's permission to work, to travel, to open a bank account. And women lost the vote, a right that they had only gained in 1933. And divorce was made illegal. In the wake of, to return to Mar Marusha and Coralia, in the wake of their public humiliation and possible torture, um, even as they took their, their daily strolls, they were marginalized. They were shunned and insulted by neighbors who called them locas and solteronas. These are Spanish terms um, put together. It means basically crazy spinsters. Um, they were given nicknames that, have, that stripped them um, of their personhood. As Marias, the, the Marias, as das duas en punto. And I loosely translate this as the two o'clock girls again because of taking their daily stroll at exactly two o'clock. Um, small children were taught to avert their gaze from the sisters. They were considered to be dangerous. And here we can see how Marusha and Coralia's neighbors aided and abetted in their marginalization um, because they themselves were afraid. Somebody 
showing solidarity with these sisters would have been considered suspect, complicit with them. And yet, in spite of all this, there were acts of solidarity. The sisters had no work. No one would take them, um, like commission them to sew anything anymore, again, because that would have been seen as being complicit with them, supporting them. So the sisters had no work. They had no income. They had no protections from the state. And yet, um, neighbors left money at local shops so that the sisters could buy food. Neighbors left food for them at their, um, at their home and they were able to survive. In spite of the ridicule and the name calling, the sisters continued their uh, daily strolls for decades. Marusha passed away in 1980 at the age of 82 and Coralia in 1983 at the age of 68. So I'm gonna do this uh, like jump in time here um, to memorialization of these sisters in the present. So this very recent past, um, recent efforts to remember Marusha and Coralia and efforts to remember them not as these, you know, crazy spinsters or eccentrics that were wandering the streets of Santiago, but remembering them as courageous women who in their own way resisted the dictatorship. Um, public homages to Marusha and Coralia began to be held in 2011. Um, and I just want to note here, the homage to Coralia and Marusha in um, Galician, it was called, a, um, and the word is, is up here on the slide, um, a mujere nashe, which is an invented Galician word that's basically a feminization of the word um, homage. So the first one, the first homage um, to these women in 2011 was born um, out of an idea of the historian and politician Encarna Otero de Peda. And I'll say more about her in a minute. And it was supposed to be do, it was supposed to do two things. Um, be a form of re remembrance of women who, uh, people who struggled against fascism, particularly working class women that she didn't see represented in stories um, about the dictatorship. And, um, and then a focus on women engaged in what were considered to be unrecognized forms of resistance to the Franco regime. So not all forms of resistance to the regime were like military style forms of resistance. So I want to say um, a bit about the um, about the homage and some of the symbolism involved in it. Um, the homage is always held at a city park. Um, participants gather at the statue of Marusha and Coralia that had been erected in the 1990s. That's the one um, I showed you earlier that was kind of in bad shape. The date that it's held is symbolic. It's held on July 18th, the anniversary of the military uprising that began the Spanish Civil War. And the time of the gathering is symbolic. It's held at 2 p.m., the time that the sisters, once again, would take their daily stroll. And this slide shows the flyer that was disseminated on social media to advertise the homage that I attended in 2007. Um, purple, as you can see, is a predominant color. It's associated with feminism and feminist movements internationally. An old photograph of Marusha and Coralia shows them alongside of a bicycle, which has also been colored in purple. And the text underneath reads, Moitas formas de repression, otros modelos de resistencia. Many forms of repression, other models of resistance. And the flyer calls for attendees to wear colorful dresses and makeup and, um, and to bring flowers. So, this is, um, now I get to tell you even more stories. Um, this, this, is, this is a photograph I took at the, um, at the, at the Mujer Nashe, the homage. Um, and it's an, it's an excerpt from my own um, field notes. So um, the sisters were invoked with colors, with flowers, with vivid makeup and clothing. Many of the women present, and there were mostly women there, um, wore artificial flowers in their hair, dresses splashed with floral patterns, tight red dresses, crimson lipstick, and they carried flowers, carnations, drangias, mostly in the colors red and violet. And this served to invoke the tricolor flag of Spain's Second Republic, um, which the colors of which were red, yellow, and purple. And after the speeches and the call to return year after year, uh, always on July 18th, always at 2 p.m., 
we all applauded when the um, speakers decried down with fascism, down with repression. And this is um, another another slide. You can see another other view here of the of the colors and of the statue, and again of the of the flowers here that are representative um, of the of the republic. And one of the things that I began to think about, and I'm still thinking through, is that instead of setting aside beauty and color and femininity itself as a peripheral or even distracting from political activism. Um, what was going on here is that um, these activists were trying to understand things as potentially intrinsic to political activism itself. And it seems that these new forms of engagement with the past, such as this homage, right, and this work of memory, that it facilitates the potential for new forms of political imagination to emerge. And I would still say that this is very much in inchoate form. So we're at the really beginnings of it, but there's an idea here that political activism can um, involve exuberance. It can involve a kind of playful eroticism. It can involve color. It can involve satire and laughter. And um, this is something that I still want to um, explore more. <clears throat> so some more stories of resistance. Um, it became clear to me too that the homage to Marusha and Coralia became a site where the stories of the sisters were told that conjured up details of their lives and in a sense resurrected their apparent, apparent rebellious behavior for the, pre for the present moment. Um, a woman I mentioned before, Encarna Otero Cepeda, um, the woman who began the tradition of the homage in 2011. Um, I, was, I found an interview with her and, and found this quote um, here and it just has, um, it just, it, it haunts me and it, um, I'm still, I'm kind of, I continue to think about it and kind of work with it. Um, so she said um, in this interview that when these sisters were subject to the machinations of state power, they were beaten down by what she calls the unholy trinity of the Falange, that's the Spanish fa fascist party, the Catholic church and the military. And she says, as a direct consequence of that, they went mad. But she also claims that the madness was in a strange sense, if I'm interpreting her correctly, a kind of gift because it allowed the sisters to, as she says, recover the dream of youth and once again, stroll through the streets of Santiago as they did during the time of optimism in the second Republic. But she says, now they do so with a difference. Um, she says, she says, now they're as squalid as if they just came out of a concentration camp, missing teeth. They dressed in light and color and were covered with makeup as if a representation of a mask rice powder, blush, red lipstick. And dressed like this, made up like this and almost this mockery of fe feminine beauty or a kind of abject feminine beauty, um, they go walking around the city, always at 2 p.m. Um, Lola, Lola um, Ferreiro um, spoke at the homage um, that I attended and others. She was trained as a doctor and now works um, largely in issues of women's health in the government of Galicia. And she spoke, um, one of the YouTube recordings I, I saw of her speaking, um, she said, again, something interesting. They adapted to that terrible situation by constructing their own world of colors and flower covered dresses and kerchiefs decorated with, um, with colors they went out with a lot of makeup on and let themselves be seen all around Compostela. It's a show of absolutely creative resistance to fascism. And I think there's a lot to be said about what she, about her remarks, including whether or not the sisters constructed their colorful world as an intentional act of resistance, as she describes, or if all that theatrical color was a symptom of their madness as Encarna Otero would have it, 
But what's clear here, I think what's important is that with all that color and those bodies, right, that showed the marks of poverty and terror visited upon them in the state, they made a spectacle of themselves. And I mean that in the best way possible, or that's how these women are interpreting it. They made themselves visible, hyper visible. And this act, whether or not it was intentional, it flew in the face of norms for women during the dictatorship when, again, women were supposed to be quiet, sexless mothers under the watchful gaze of the men in their, in their families. This is, and I kind of apologize, although um, it's, it's also a good story. So um, I know this is a text heavy slide. Um, so at the very first homage uh, in 2011, the author and uh, professor of Spanish literature named Teresa More, um, she spoke and I found a copy of her, of her talk. Um, she wove together what was known of Marusha and Coralia um, their apparent eccentricities, their violation of gender norms, to, and she told a story about them that represents their direct resistance to fascism. Um, that, as she says, came from a place of them having nothing left to lose. And I've ex translated excerpts from the original Galician here. Um, and so she says, they went out in search of men and when they found someone they catcalled, they, they shouted obscenities and were told, Kala puta, shut up, bitch. But they would just laugh deep in their throats. They laughed at those fascists and sons of fascists with their uniforms and combs in their pockets so as to keep their hair nice and smooth, laughed at the insecurity and fear of those fascists and sons of fascists. Coralia and Marusha learned what all the defeated know. Once they take away your dignity, they can't do anything else to you. And so two o'clock is the time of rebellion. And uh, again, this is one of the, those pieces that I keep thinking about. And one of the things when I was right, when I was like writing this talk, preparing for it, I was thinking that it, their laughter as she describes it here, it might come from madness, it might, but it still is a weapon. It cuts through the surface appearance of things. It cuts through those kind of smooth surfaces, all those um, that, are uh, that are associated with the fascist officials, like their uniforms and, and the perfect hair. Um, and it reveals who they are, um, that they're cowards essentially, who are afraid of anyone who thought or behaved differently than they did and who therefore would not hesitate to use brutal forms of violence in order to maintain what would otherwise be a precarious hold on power. And I think what um, More is doing here is that she's imagining and interpreting the sister's laughter as a way to speak truth to power. And even if just for a moment to dismantle it. And I think there's something else that's going on here that's really important. And that's that according to More, there, this laughter, it's resonating across time and space. It becomes like a universal story of, of brutalized people. It unites them with other people in other places who have been brutalized at the hands of the state. And this laughter echoes in the time that Teresa More is, um, is writing and speaking. She says two o'clock is, not it was, but it is the time of rebellion. And again, something that comes out super clearly is that there's always the need to rebel against and root out fascist and authoritarian tendencies in society. Spain, as elsewhere in Europe, as right here in the United States, has seen in recent years the reemergence of right wing extremist groups, some of which have explicitly fascist. Um, ideologies. So this is my this is my last um, slide um, kind of in in lieu of a, a conclusion. Um, I just want to bring it uh, just a couple years closer to the present. Um, most recently we can see on the on the right hand side that dilapidated statue at the park where the homage was held. Um, it was freshly painted and that was due to the to the activists, right, who um, were holding the homage there, they they demanded it. Um, the colors, pink, yellow, red, the purple of the umbrella, 
once again, they gesture toward the memory of the, um, of the Second Republic. They evoke the colors of the Republic's flag. And this might seem like just such a small gesture, but I wanna emphasize how important these small gestures are in a place like Spain, where those taboos against critically, um, up against, against like remembering or critically examining the time of the dictatorship, that has meant that to this day, there is still no, um, there's still like no museum, no institutional place where the Republic is remembered or where the, or the war is remembered or where the dictatorship is remembered. That is not, that has not happened. People are working toward it, but it hasn't happened. So it remains is that people do these right small things. Again, gestures that can accumulate. And then I wanna point out um, on, the, on the left there, um, this is taken during, um, Carnival, Carnival. Um, this was this photograph was taken by a friend of mine who lives in Santiago in 2019. Um, there is no Carnival in 2020 because of the uh, the pandemic. Um, the Marusha and Cardalia, we just um, we see them right, kind of striding through the the streets once again. Um, so that represents my initial observations, explorations of how people in Santiago. Um, feminists, activists, novelists, other people have tried to wrest this memory of, um, of Karusha and Karalia from the brink of oblivion. They tell stories, they attend homages, they bring offerings. And in this way, I think they are trying to contend with the past um, and to do justice to those who were brutalized during the regime. And perhaps most important to create new ways to fight against fascist tendencies in, in all of its forms, both past and present. So that is the end. I am going to figure out how to stop sharing my slides now. Okay. So thank, um, thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I'm I'm reeling with associations and uh, you know ideas. I really, really, uh, I think that we were all uh, very appreciative of this this window into an aspect of, of women's history that that most of us just had no idea happened and its recent history. So uh, you hugely appreciate it, Jenny. And now we move on to uh, our Q and A, uh, and we have to to do some um some uh security measures here i'm clicking on uh allowing uh the attendees to unmute themselves if they have questions and i will also monitor the chat to see if if i can repeat some uh, questions that are being asked uh so right now do we have any uh questions from the attendees people who would like to have their voices heard it looks like Jonathan has his hand up. Jonathan McLeod. Yeah, hi. hi. Uh, I wanted to ask, hi, I wanted to ask who is organizing the homages and are these uh, people uh, consistent over time? Do they have uh, parents perhaps that were involved or grandparents that were involved in the Spanish Civil War? So it's, it's interesting. Um, it, so like I, I mentioned, there's a historian who's um, involved and um, I have to, one of the things that I wanna do when, um, when, I go, when I go back to Spain is actually interview some of these, these people that um, I talked about. So Encarna Otero Cepeda is very much a polit political activist, but she's also a historian herself. And this was really like, um, this was her idea. She started it and she is always present at the, um, at the homages. But also um, a long time ago, um, uh, Santiago had a feminist bookstore and then it closed. And then um, a, another one was open in 2011. And it doesn't just work as a, as a bookstore. It's also very much um, like a community organizing place. And so the owner of this bookstore, this is very much like a, a kind of small project sort of thing. There's just one, one woman who runs the, the um, whole bookstore. Um, she has worked with these political, um, you know, these people who are in politics because uh, Lola Ferreiro too is in the Galician government. 
Um, and so she's worked with the, these people in order to have this um, homage uh, every, every year. So yeah, there's some main people who in the organization have remained consistent. And the only one of these who, and I really should have mentioned her in this presentation, but it's hard to get to everybody, is um, the place of this, this bookstore slash kind of community center and its role, right, in, um, in organization. Okay, I have a question from uh, Shauna Ryan in the chat. Uh, have uh, these two women been memorialized through films or novels? No, films or novels, no. As far as I know, well, there's been a, a documentary. Um, there's a Galician language documentary that came out relatively recently. Not in, not in novels as far as I know, but I have to investigate this. Um, there's been a play, and again, relatively, um, relatively recent. And this is part of what I'm really interested in. I'm interested in um, not just like kind of a, I'm interested in how this sparks all this kind of um, creative work and this creative imagination um, around these, these women. And part of that, this is happening in absence of, of um, kind of rich historical um, information. I mean, they were ordinary women, right? Nobody was docu uh, documenting their, um, their lives while they were alive, except for these, these pictures that, uh, these few pictures that happened to circulate because people did took, took pictures because they thought they were so weird in, in part. But yeah, I wanna investigate all of these, this kind of creative activity. And so this is something that I need to look more into. But as far as I know right now, there is no like fictional, like feature films or novels that have, um, that have the women in them. Thank you, Jenny. We have a question from Isabel. Isabel, do you want to? Yeah, here we go. <clears throat> Jenny, for, first of all, what a fantastic talk. I was looking forward to it as soon as I got the notice. So thank you for that. Uh, having grown up under Franco in Spain in the 1960s and in a small village, not in Galicia, but uh, you know, very poor family up in the mountains of the province of Alicante. All I remember of Franco was the day he died, I got the day off from school. Uh, so. But this idea of the past and the fear and, you know, the, the talking about it and you can't talk out loud of this, you know, your neighbors are going to turn it. All that I remember my family really saying, you know, you, you need to forget that and, and just move forward. So this attempt to move forward and this idea of, you know, we are moving forward for a better goal, which is to bring democracy, legalize the Communist Party and things like that. It, now we are paying for it. People of my generation, we never learned about the Civil War. And in fact, I remember my abuela and my mother and, every, you know, the, it was a small village, a, a thousand people at most. So you knew where people stood and they always talked about Los Años del Hambre, you know, the years of the hunger. It's like I had enough of that. But now we are going back to that. So and, you know, it, it's, it's very raw for me because I was just transcribing recently uh just a, an amateur interview i did of my uncle who joined the republican side because he didn't have anything to eat and he was told if you join they'll give you un chusco you know a piece of bread every day so he did he ended up in a concentration camp in, in melilla in north africa and i happened to record this and i finally found those recordings so it, it's it, it's there and i think it's time for spain to really move forward and one last thing I want to say is when you were showing the pictures of Marusha and, and Coralia, I noticed the hairpiece uh, and, and one of them. And it's also, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but I see a statement of nationalism, not political right wing, but a statement of who you are in terms of your culture. As somebody who grew up not being allowed to speak my native language or learn in it, you know, that nationalism piece for Galicia, I see it in the clothing. So just an observation, but overall, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, every time I hear these stories, it just, um, 
just enriches the, the, the stories that I've heard and in, in the context of Galicia. And um, yeah, I, there's, so, there's, so, there's so much more to discuss and talk about um, in terms of, for example, just to pick up on that last thing that, that you said, um, Spain is an incredibly um, diverse country um, culturally and linguistically. And one of the things that happened during the Franco um, dictatorship is that um, people um, weren't um, able to, they weren't allowed to, um, to use their language or especially in, 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 pu in, in public places. So like the Basque language, the Catalan language. Um, so um, as uh, in the, the cultural context where Isabel comes from, um, and the Galician um, language, the, this were repressed. Any sign of cultural difference from from um, Castilla, where the the central part of Spain, these were um, these were brutally depressed, suppressed. And I also wanted just to make a comment on um, um, on what Isabel said also about hunger. I was um, my my husband's grandmother um, was born in Spain in 1936, so the year that the war broke out. And one time I asked her um, what her first memory was. And she said that her first memory was when she was about four years old and it was of being hungry. Um, it's, there is so much to be said about how hunger, and this wasn't accidental, that hunger um, and um, rationing food um, was, used purposefully um, in the post um, civil war period to dominate um, to dominate the, the the population and it's a widespread phenomenon of um, of just almost almost anybody unless they were in a particular position of power uh, just by anybody who grew up in that time period Jenny we have a question in the chat from Monty uh, do they use any other forms of statement besides wearing uh, certain colors? Let me see. Um, I'm trying to find that. Um, could you read that question one more time, please? Yes. Uh, do they use, did they use any other forms of a statement besides wearing certain colors? The sisters. No, the sister. it was just that combination. Um, although, and again, this is part of what I didn't have room to put in this talk, but the fact that they wore all that color was in extremely symbolic for people who, um, who are now thinking about them in, in the present. Um, people often refer to the time of the dictatorship as being gray. And gray in Spain, um, it has all sorts of symbolic connotations as well um, as being, you know, just like a color. Um, as, as we could imagine in English too, that everything was monotonous and people dressed very austerely and um, and the city of Santiago it's very rainy there it's made um, the medieval part of the city it's constructed of of granite so it's gray stone the sky is um, the sky is gray um, some of the the police force at that time they were called los grises because they had gray uniforms everything was gray and some people when they talk about Marusha and Coralia in the present, they talk about them as being, one of my favorite quotes is from um, a filmmaker who described them as these ephemeral butterflies of light floating through the gray days of, uh, of the dictatorship. And so just not even the, like the specifics of the colors of the clothes they wore, but just that color was something that um, at least in the present, right? Um, people find, reinterpret as the sign of, of resistance. Um, and no, I think it was, it was for the sisters too, the, what made them seem so rebellious, the color, the fact that they were the, all that makeup. And again, they weren't made, I didn't really emphasize this, but they weren't made up in a way that was like, that made them look kind of um, pretty in any conventional sense. It was like mask-like makeup. It almost like, that's why I say like almost like a mockery of, of feminine beauty. And then on top of that, they did something that women did not do. They went out at two o'clock because at two o'clock in Spain, that's the time that um, the siesta begins. That's the time that um, people have their main meal of the day to the present, right? And so Santiago being a university town, all the students, mostly men, 
would pour out of the buildings to go to restaurants. And that's why they took their walks at that time. So they run into all those young men, catcalling them, shouting obscenities. And so all of this together, right, um, made this their, their action so, so symbolic, symbolic of this apparent madness, right, at, at the time, and then symbolic from the point of view of the present of, of, of bravery, of resistance. Oh, there's a question in the chat, and this is from Scott, and uh, I'm going to read it to you. Um, I'm thinking of Don Quixote, uh, the book by the Spanish author Cervantes. The hero exists in the world where uh, outsiders can't quite tell whether he's crazy and therefore to be shunned, or somehow honorable and therefore someone to be idealized. Is this theme of the perfect mad person common in Spanish culture? Do other people draw parallels between the sisters and Quixote? Are these sisters becoming folklorized now? Well, I'm so excited by this question because um, I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> but it makes me think of things. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I have never heard anyone draw a parallel between the sisters and Quixote. And I think that is fascinating and I have to write this down. Um, good thing that it saves the chat so I'll have a copy of it. Um, but it also, I wonder if part of the reason why, and to pick up that on something else that actually Isabel um, said earlier, is because um, in, in Spain, um, these, uh, these, these um, different regions of Spain, particularly those that um, are what they call um, historical nationalities, that's the, ter that's the term in Spanish that's used, the Basque country, um, Catal Catalonia, and also um, Galicia, they have um, in all of these, um, and it's particularly strong in the Basque country and Catal Catalonia, they have a nationalist um, element. And again, like Isabel was saying, this is not a, a nationalism as kind of, um, well, there are right-wing nationalists, but often it's very left-wing and it's often about trying to promote like autonomy and culture and, um, and the language, right? Which was repressed for so long in these particular places. So why am I bringing this up now? Well, it makes me wonder because there are a lot of people who organize these homages in Galicia, they are, they are left-wing Galician nationalists. There's a nationalist element that runs through this, right? And so I just wonder, um, Quixote, he's from La Mancha. This is central Spain. This is almost like archetypical, you know, Spain of, of, of the windmills and all of this. And I just wonder if maybe they don't want to make that connection. But I find it very interesting. You know, I wonder if that's why they don't bring in Don Quixote because he, that's like an outsider sort of figure, if you, if you see what I, um, I mean. Um, but I think it's a fascinating thing to look into, into more. Um, and this whole idea of, of, of the um, idealization of, of, the, of the quote unquote mad person. So thank you for that question. And then as for the, if the sisters are becoming folklorized now, um, I don't know if this is exactly how you meant this question, but when I think of like the process of folklorization in Spain, I think of it on kind of like the grand scale of things. So for example, um, a couple of things that got really folklorized during the, the dictatorship kind of and became emblematic of Spanish culture writ large were um, flamenco and bullfighting, right? Um, and nobody in the part of Spain where I work that goes to bullfights or dances flamenco, but, um, but these are right parts of a culture from Southern Spain that then became kind of like writ large. This is Spanish culture, all right. Um, so I think that, I guess I would say, no, that they're not becoming folklorized now because it's too small scale, it's too localized, if that makes sense. Um, so it's not at that, it's not at that point. It's interesting though, now I'm gonna contradict myself a little bit as I'm thinking these things through. Um, 
they were famous in Santiago before people really dug into their history. But they were famous almost, now I'm going to use that term, almost in a folklorized way, just for her being, again, these kind of eccentric women that dressed up and wandered around Santiago. And this was like, oh, like that, that's, that, that was that, almost like an attraction for, um, for Santiago. Maybe one could say that they're almost becoming defolklorized now, right? As that, that particular image is being deconstructed um, over time through complicating their, their history. So that's a good, thank you um, again for that question because it's making me um, um, think about things that I haven't really thought, thought through yet. Uh, before we go to the next question, I I, sh I just want to throw this in because I do you know I do narrative philosophy and uh, looking at archetypes and uh, you know, patterns uh, that that uh, help uh, you know as uh, explaining identities and so forth. And I'm just thinking Hamlet. I mean, there's 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 our mad rebel uh, e expressed as, as an archetype, uh, but it doesn't mean that different cultures can't come up with the same image of the, the trickster, the, the, mm. the mad one that, um, uh, that gets to tell the truth uh, in some kind of guise. Right? So I, yeah, <laughs> I love that. Um, Thank you. We have, um, did, did, did you want to comment on that? Just that I, I'm so glad that you brought that up because in anthropology, a lot of anthropologists um, uh, have done work on like trickster figures because as you said, right, this is, um, this is something that exists uh, cross-culturally. And it didn't occur to me to think of the, of the sisters in, 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 in quite that way. But, um, but I, 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 again, I love that and I want to explore that, um, that more. Thank you. How, how very cool. And I, I have to say that, um, you know, I started out in, in academic life uh, in anthropology and then uh, I switched to philosophy. So I still have my heart still beats for, for anthropology uh, in, in, in a corner of my life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I see there's, there's a hand. I don't know if, if Jonathan has another remark. Uh, Jonathan, is there something that you would like to add? Yeah, I, I'll uh, follow up on my earlier question. Was there a time when these memorializations started to become popular after a long period of silence? What triggered it? Uh, have perhaps people that are of parental age been bringing up their young to participate as well? So. I think part of um, part of what I mentioned is that for um, that could, that that could be true, right? That someone is from a um, like a historically left um, left wing family, um, but part of it is, and I think this is something that um, I mentioned, is that for a generation of people. Okay, so the dictatorship ended in 1975, and for people who may have even been before um, born before that time. Um, you know, before the dictatorship actually ended, um, but still things were kind of starting to shift and fade out um, and they really came of age during the transition, which I should say, I mean, again, this opening up in all these times of uh, interesting times in Spanish history, there was um, this uh, time in Spain, especially like early 80s, it was called the Movida, and it was like this outpouring of transgressive cultural energy. Like if you guys know the, the filmmaker, um, Pedro Almodovar, his um, famous Spanish filmmaker, his early films in particular are incredibly um, transgressive and all these things. And so uh, one of the things I was, I was trying to get at in our talk is in part, it is just um, the, the fear that was in place that Isabel talked about as well. I think for some of these people that came of age um, after the death of Franco, that fear began to seem some began to seem very abstract. It was no longer this kind of um, really you know visceral fear of like a civil war could happen again, um, which older generations felt. And um, 
the reason why I brought up two, like Emilio Silva, that journalist who looked for the grave of his grandfather and managed to get it exhumed and then founded the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory. That was a watershed moment, I think, in, in Spain, um, in that it was no longer this kind of clandestine underground thing to be, um, to be doing memorializations of many kinds, right? Whether it's the, the type of for Marusha and Coralia, or um, or you know the the the, the, con the continuing work of exhuming um, graves. So I think I would say that it was around that time that things kind of picked up, and that there were more um, public memorializations talking about the past, the publication of novels that were set in. Um, in the war, war period, or the um, or the or the post or the post war period, and the and the dictatorship, but the um, again the exhumations that was a pivotal moment, and I would say another pivotal moment, or could have been a pivotal moment, was in two thousand and seven, when um, the law of historical memory was passed, and what this was supposed to do it was supposed to give funding to these associations for the recuperation of historical memory so that they could um, uh, exhume graves with um, actually the support of the state. But it was also supposed to do other things like remove statues of Franco um, and uh, uh, from public plazas and, and street names and all this. So a lot of the that kind of work, especially in the 2000s, early 2000s was maybe not as much memorializing as such, except for the exhumations that always involved a memorialization. But part of it was just like to remove signs of the dictatorship out of the, uh, out of the public um, sphere. And so it's been a, a, like a gradual process. And again, it wasn't till with the specific instance of Marusha and Cordalia, we can kind of see how then that started in the wake of these other kinds of movements in 2011 was the, um, was the first homage. I will say also, just to come back to a part of your question, um, Emilio Silva, again, that journalist who, um, who started kind of the, the contemporary movement to exhume the, um, the graves, his family was left-wing um, and his grandfather was a Republican that had been killed and his body dumped in a mass grave. And he had heard stories about that, right? And so, but he was the one. And I think that generational aspect is really important that made it so he was the one that actually felt like he could go out and, um, and investigate and actually take action. So I hope that helps to address some of your questions. Yeah, thank, thank you very, thank you very much. That was great. Thanks. Do we have any more questions either uh, in the chat or um, anybody wanting to speak and be on the screen? I see one from Philip Salata in the chat. And also from Brian Pham. Okay. Unless they were sent directly to me, and maybe that's if you're not. I think that. I think that's what that's what is happening. Okay, let me read um, Phillips out loud, and then I can address it. Um, Philip asks, "Are there any particular cultural links between the homage and and Carnival? We see the pair in costume in 2019 in procession down the boulevard, which is already quite evocative. And I want to say thank you to Philip for that question. Because again, it allows me to talk about yet something else that I, have, that I didn't have uh, the opportunity to talk about um, during uh, during the talk itself, and um, that's um, Carnival. Is um, so this is uh, this is a holiday um, or a few days of a holiday that occurs right before the beginning of Lent. So it ends on. Um, it ends the day before Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent, which is supposed to be a time of um, maybe a bit of, of, of austerity and a little bit of self-sacrifice before, um, before Easter, right? So just to give some context. And so 
Carnival, again, is this kind of outpouring of, um, of kind of energy and fun um, and some transgression um, before everything kind of closes down for Lent. And um, interestingly, um, Carnival in Spain, all over Spain, um, it's not just about costuming, although that is very much the case. And when I lived in Spain, it was very much a holiday for kids. Um, like that was like the Halloween is like, that was the time that kids would dress up in costumes um, and see these parades. But historically in Spain, Carnival has, um, as, as you might imagine, um, when people are disguised, right? When people are wearing costumes, that gives people a, um, um, the opportunity to um, engage in political critique. So they might, um, like um, Spain is still, um, has, it's, it's still majority Catholic. And I remember when my daughter was going to preschool in Spain, there was the principal of her school, um, this man dressed up um, like a nun, which is, you know, there's like a little transgressive element there. Um, another little anecdote from that time, um, my daughter was in preschool at the time of, um, of the Great Recession in, in, in 2009. And one of the things that's, um, that, that happens every year at Carnival is that um, there is a figure that's burned in effigy. And they burned a figure in effigy at my daughter's preschool. They created a... Um, uh, like a, a, a life-size figure of a, of a man dressed in a suit it was meant to represent a banker. And then they set it on fire in the courtyard while the parents watched with all these little kids around. And then we went and I, we had like lots of, um, lots of food. So it still very retains, right? That a little bit of that political edge. So what I wanted to say um, too in response to Philip's question is that during the um, Franco era, um, Carnival was banned. It was not allowed to have any, um, you know, no one could wear costumes, no one could dress, uh, dress up in, a, in disguise because all political dissidence was also banned. Um, and so it's, um, I'm thinking back to Nina's comment about these trickster figures. Um, if Carnival is always about trickster figures, right? Then, in a sense, they were um, these these women were trickster figures, like like in, just in their everyday lives, right? Um, and so, I don't think Philip that there have been any direct ties being made, like explicitly, like by the people who are involved in the homage. But I th I certainly think with like the ideas of costuming and political tr critique embedded in, um, in costuming and disguise and these, and times of inversion, so to speak, that we can, we can make some of those links between the homage and carnival. Did we have any more uh, questions from the chat or anybody else who wants to weigh in? I think I see one more in the chat. I don't know if it was directed maybe specifically to me. Um, so Brian Pham asks, is the homage used as a reminder to rebel against fascism if it ever rises again? And are there rebellious bravery taught in the local schools? Um, so yes, to your first question, it is a reminder that, um, that one always has to be aware of, uh, of authoritarian tendencies in, um, in society. And I think um, this is a, a especially pertinent in Spain right now where a very right-wing um, group called Vox, V-O-X, um, has uh, actually gotten, um, obtained quite a bit of political power and seats in, in, par in, um, in parliament. Um, and so it is a reminder right to um to to be aware and yes to fight against um fascism and then to your second question um like is this taught about in local schools i would i would um venture venture to say no um and again 
this is part of like, I think many schools that, you know, just your ordinary public school, it's still considered to be very treacherous territory to get into some of these debates. When I've asked people, at least people my age, and I'm gonna have to ask people who have kids going um, through school now, and I know quite a few people who do, um, but when I ask people m like my age, um, who grew up in, in Spain, um, and so who grew up, were born after the dictatorship ended, when they learn about, for example, the Civil War um, in school, they do not talk at all about like the political ideologies involved. They just say there is this battle and that battle and this battle. And in other words, they, it, it becomes completely um, drained of ideas. It's just, um, you know, memorizing battles and dates. So in terms of education, I think that um, Spain still has um, quite a ways to, to go to incorporate kind of a critical examination of its history into um, school. May I speak, Jonathan? Absolutely, I, a, I, was, I was muted, go ahead. <laughs> I, I had a question, you just mentioned Vox. Did Steve Bannon, who was one of Trump's advisors and enfant terrible, who traveled around Western Europe and tried to organize right-wing nationalist groups, make connections with Vox? Oh, we have to look that up. I, I don't know if he went to Spain. I know what you're referring to, and I know he did make connections with a lot of right-wing movements. It's like, I almost want to Google it right now, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, he he may have. I mean, Vox was very successful. If you can imagine, um, in Andalusia, which has historically um, been like a stronghold of PSOE, which is the Socialist Party in in Spain, they switched a couple years ago from PSOE, the Socialist Party, to Vox, and so Vox, had, from you know the right wing standpoint, was this huge success story in Spain. And so I wouldn't have been at all surprised if, if Steve Bannon would have wanted to chat with them. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, are we at a point where um, everybody's uh, either uh, your, your thoughts are spinning in new directions and uh, you're uh, looking forward to doing your own Googling or uh, your curiosity has been satisfied? Are we reaching the end of the talk? I think so. Uh, so I will again say thank you so much to Jenny for uh, enlightening us and uh, you know, letting us think in new terms. And I want to uh, mention if you're students, while this meeting is still going on, if you haven't signed in yet in the chat with your name and your class and your professor's name, then please do it now. And uh, if you're faculty, then remember that you can get flex credit for having attended and the flex number is uh, 6411. And if you haven't signed in already, then do it before midnight tonight. And then I will also let you know that we have another occasional lecture coming up in April. So thank you so much for being here with us and celebrating Women's History Month and the uh, re-emergence of our occasional lectures tradition. Um, be safe, everybody. Uh, take care of yourselves and each other. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for coming. So give them a couple minutes, Nina, before. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, while, while we're winding down, we're rapidly winding down, but while we're winding down, um, I could ask you, so if we, if we meet, if we, after the lockdown, we're back in classes, et cetera, we're back in the hallways, if we meet at two o'clock, is that significant? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now we all know. Yes, yes, yes. A charged time of day, yes. Yes. <clears throat>
Hey, Gloria. Did we did you? So you came? Yeah, I, things I, were happening. I, I was here. I couldn't see all who was, you know, because it was on a few pages. So I'm no, glad, I'm, glad. I'm, I'm assuming everything went smoothly in the beginning. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. it did. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was <laughs> I was chatting with Nina the whole time, like hope everything's okay. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, she, yeah. She, it seemed to work out. So I think we can. I think we can just congratulate each other on uh, actually having mastered most of the necessary technique for <laughs> doing this kind of thing. Yeah, you know, I, I was I was concerned about possible disruptions, and um, nothing happened, right? When I was talking, no, no, no everything, everything was fine. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah. All right. So, all right, Jenny and Nina, I will see you both later we'll see you soon thank you for coming thank Gloria. You. okay as with every one of your as with every one of your uh videos dr sign it, it came across really well no interruptions oh thank you thank you see I'm you next week take, yes i'll see you in uh yep next week next week all right take care and nina thank you for hosting this you are welcome and thank you for for being here see you guys later Hope to see you in Hope you hope to see you in a class of mine. Could be. You never know. Bye, Bill. Bye bye. Okay. I think everybody who wanted to sign in, they have. Yeah, I think so. Um, so we can probably end. Um and um and yeah, so you'll save the chat. Maybe you can send the chat to me. I will send the chat. We probably get different chats saved so oh, i will send whatever chat i get i'll send to you okay that sounds um, um that sounds yeah. really good and again thank you for your question i mean this is the best thing about giving a talk especially when it's still kind of exploratory is you know especially different people in different disciplines always have their takes on on these issues it's it's one of the great things that that can happen in this kind of setting here you get get an idea from elsewhere that that propels you on so i've, I've had that happen to me too so yeah that's, yeah that's really really nice well I'm, I'm happy about that yeah i'm yeah i'm glad i'm glad it all went so smoothly well thank you yep. and um yeah i hope yep. you have a good weekend yeah. Uh, this weekend, I will get all our tax papers together. <laughs> so, uh, it will yeah. be a productive weekend, if not a relaxing weekend. Yes, it'll be productive. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Take care. Thank you. You too. Okay. I am. Yeah. I am ending this. Okay, okay. So everybody, thanks for being here. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.